What's up guys? So today I've got something pretty interesting for you. The uh, guys at Teleco Fishing Club have actually invited me to come to their monthly meeting and talk to them about fall and winter fishing. So I'm actually heading that way right now. So this is going to be a really fun experience. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to set my camera up and record my little uh, seminar quote unquote i got 45 minutes to talk about fishing so what i'm going to actually do is show them the video that i made a couple weeks back is the three minute thursday uh where i built that box full of fall baits is all the baits i thought should get you guys through the fall and what i'm going to do is i'm going to show that video but then i'm going to go into that box and i'm going to break down each bait in detail and uh, then i might cover you know right at the end cover some winter topics as well but i thought it'd be something cool for you guys to watch i know you guys are always wanting to you know hear detailed explanations about baits and all that so here's a chance for you guys to listen uh to me talk about all that stuff and just come along on a cool experience for me because it's actually the first time i've ever done this so as always guys thank you for watching and hopefully you will enjoy today's episode well i'm alex rudd like i said um i'm i actually run a youtube fishing channel um so that's how Pete got in touch with me. Um, that's kind of how I've grown to be where I'm at now in, in the fishing industry, you would say. Um, I started my YouTube channel probably three years ago. Um, I posted like one video and never thought it would do anything. And it ended up getting like, you know, 2,000 views or something, it wasn't many. And uh, I thought, you know what, I'll post some more and like try to do this. And as I started to do it, my channel started to slowly grow. Um, and as of today, I am at 9,400 subscribers, almost 10,000 now. Um, so it's kind of crazy to think that there's 10,000 people out there that want to watch me gab at a, at a camera and go catch fish. But it's really, really cool. Um, but I'm, you got the video ready to go? I got a video for you guys to watch. I do a series called Three Minute Thursdays. Um, and I try to on every Thursday um, just kind of do a really quick video where I talk about fishing. Um, so this is just one type of video that I do, uh, but I'll let you guys watch this and then I'll actually get into this type of box and go in detail on each bag. And in this box, I'm going to all the things that I think you guys need to have to have a successful fall season and to catch a lot of bass. So let's put three minutes on the clock and get started. First things first is for right now. For when the grass is matted up and the bass are hanging out in it, the number one thing is a frog. I'm going to get a dark frog for the sunny days and a white frog for the cloudy days. The next thing for that grass is a puncher rig, a big ounce, ounce and a half beast coast tungsten flipper weight to punch through that matted grass to get some of those bites when they're not wanting to blow up on the frog. Now for the lakes that don't have a lot of grass or for when the bass are schooling on bait fish, some sort of topwater. Obviously, I'm going to put a whopper plopper in there just because I love it, but I'm also going to throw some kind of walking bait in there as well just to have a little bit different presentation. Then the next thing is a spinner bait. This is a great bait for when they're not wanting to blow up on a topwater, but they're still eating a ton of bait fish. The little spinner bait does an absolute great job of imitating small balls of bait fish, and that Nichols Pulsator is the best spinner bait when you can buy. Now there's the biggest part of my box with really the most baits in it, and that's my cranking section. The first thing I'm gonna put in there is a square bill. This is gonna help me to get into that little bit heavier cover when those bats are oriented to that, but still eating the bait fish. The square bill is gonna do a great job of that. Then I'm also gonna put in there some small body crankbaits like your bandits and your wigger warts. With these, I'm gonna go with those crawl colors, those bright oranges, methylates, uh, the dark browns, the pinks. These are gonna do a great job of imitating those crawdads and to get a bunch of bites. Then I'm also gonna throw in that section a small shad imitator like the shad rat, just for when they're not wanting to eat on the crawfish as hard and they're wanting something in that shad profile, the shad rat is gonna do a great job of that. Then for when they're still wanting something moving, but they started to slow down towards the end of the fall, I've got a lipless crankbait. I'm gonna have a shad imitator. I'm gonna have some bright chartreuse color from when the water starts to get a little bit darker and deeper. And then I'm gonna have those crawl imitators. And those are great for when the bass slow down. They don't wanna chase the small crankbait, but they still wanna eat something moving. Then for when we start to get into the late, late fall, I'm gonna go with the jerk bait. This is gonna do a great job of imitating those dying or wounded bait fish. Um, it just does a great job when the water cools down and they want something suspended in their face. When you suspend this thing and then twitch it again, a lot of times you're gonna get a bunch of big bites on the jerk bait. And then last but not least is a jig. I'm gonna go with a flipping jig for 
earlier in the fall when they're still shallow, and I'm going to go with a dragon jig for when they start to transition deep again and go to their wintering holes. And that is it. That box right there, in my opinion, has got everything in it that you guys need to go out there, conquer the fall, have a successful fall season of fishing, and to catch a bunch of fish. And with 14 seconds to spare, hopefully you guys enjoyed this three minute Thursday. Any questions or comments you got, go leave them in the comment section down below. If you're new to my channel, make sure and hit that subscribe button. But as always, you'll hear all that right now. You guys are shooting. Then there's going to be a screen for you. I had to add Kermit in there at the end. He's going to make an appearance. He's going to make a good appearance. All right, so my favorite way to catch them is when they're eating that right there. I love to catch them on a frog. Frog and deep cranking are my two favorite. But like I said, I'm going to get into this box. I'm going to break it down each bait individually, kind of go way more in depth than I did there. That was just kind of an overview. Talk about rod, reel, line, you know, the whole, the whole thing. Um, so the first thing I said is a frog. I love fishing a frog, especially this time of year. If you're fishing lakes like Chickamauga, Watts Bar, uh, even Loudon, you know, way up like in the river uh, near downtown Knoxville, you're going to run into grass, and especially matted grass. Um, the most productive type of grass that I've found around here is milfoil. Um, bass will orient to other types of aquatic vegetation, but milfoil is the only type that does what is called a cheese mat, and that's pretty much when it tops out. Um, a fungus grows on top of that topped out milfoil and it creates like this, looks like cheese, it's like a cheesy substance. Um, and the frog is probably the best way to cover a lot of water um, and be able to fish that matted grass effectively. And what happens is the largemouth actually get under that matted grass and they just kind of hang out down there. Um, those mats have everything the bass needs. It has plenty of oxygen, so it has a lot of dissolved oxygen in the water which attracts all the bait fish, the bluegill, even crawdads will crawl around in those mats and eat um, on the grass and stuff like that. And when that happens, you know, the small crawdads attract the bluegills and then the big bass eat on the bluegills and the frog just looks like a bait fish or a bluegill that's got hung up on top or even a, you know, an actual frog because frogs will get in that grass and live as well. I'm going to throw uh, this type of bait on a seven to seven and a half foot. I really want to lean more towards um, a shorter rod, um, just because you know working the bait, you're gonna have trouble if you got like a seven and a half foot rod and the tips in the water. That's no fun. Um, I'm a tall guy, but some people are kind of shorter, and you know, short arms. Like my girlfriend loves to fish a frog as well, and she can't fish like a big seven and a half foot rod. Um, so lean more towards like a seven, seven three, heavy action, fast tip. And I'm going to pair that with a 7 or higher gear ratio reel, like a 7 1, 7 2, or even 8 1 is what I throw on my frog rod and 65 pound braid. And that braid is going to do 65 pound, yeah. That braid's going to do a couple things for you. Number one, it's going to allow you to really just smack them in the face. And with this frog, you got to, you got to think, it's pretty much like a jig hook in here. These are just big, stout, I mean, like you can't bend these hooks out. If you do bend them out, that means you hooked a giant or you did something wrong. But um, so, you know, when the bass comes up, if, you, if you're fishing in that matted vegetation, a bass is going to come up and he's not only going to eat that frog, he's going to eat about five pounds of grass with it, especially if it's a big one. He's going to come up through that mat, he's going to grab that grass, and he's going to grab that frog. So now, not only do you have to set the hook, both of these big jig hooks, into the, fro or into the fish's mouth, but you got to come through all that grass and hit him with it too. Um, so a lot of the times, you know, I've found that you know, some bass, it just depends on the day, the way they're setting up, the weather conditions, all that kind of stuff. They'll be set up either like way back in the mat or right on the edges. And when they're way back in the mat, I've hooked fish on the end of a cast. And that braid, that heavy rod is going to allow you to just hit them as hard as you can, get that frog hook into them and get into the boat. Because fishing with a frog is probably the hookup ratio is already low just because of the nature of the bait. You've got a, a bait with hooks that are hid, you've got a bass coming up through vegetation, you're already trying to sit through the grass into the bass and everything like that, and then plus, 
the bass has got to collapse that frog and get those hooks exposed. Um, so having the right gear, like that heavy braid on that, is just going to help you to get them out of that cover. Um, and then too, with a frog, this time of year, the you know the fish are going to start eating on bait fish. You can open, fish this thing in open water. It's one of my favorite things to do is fish a frog in open water. Uh, anywhere that you would, uh, your question? Is it hollow? Yeah, it's hollow body. Yeah, so it's just a standard, just hollow body. This is a spro frog. Um, I really only use spro in Nori's. It's a <laughs> Japanese company. Um, those are really the only two frogs I use just because I've had the best experience with them. And any questions you guys got, just raise your hand. Where do you, where do you get that? Um, tackle warehouse, local tackle shops. I mean, anywhere. You know what I mean? It's, it's pretty much a standard in, in any tackle shop. Um, but yeah, fishing this thing open water is one of my favorite things to do. And when you're fishing in open water, I'm still using the same rod reel line setup. Um, but fishing in open water, a lot of times they're just going to smoke it. I mean, they're going to have this thing in the back of their throat, and and you're going to be able to just hit them and, and get them. Yeah. Straight to the braid. Straight braid. Yep. Yeah. Just 65 pound braid straight to it. That was the question. Yep. 65 pound braid. That's a. Uh, What's the weight? Uh, I think these weigh maybe like three eighths. There's some that are like three quarter. Um, it just depends. They're all weighted a little bit different. This is a 65 size, so this is the biggest one that Spro makes. Um, and most of your standard frogs are going to be 65 millimeters is what it is. Um, they do make some giant frogs. I fished with those before. I've got some, you know, some decent bites on it, but it just seems like this profile is the best in both matted grass and um, open water. And then the next thing I was talking about is a punching rig. And really punching or flipping in general this time of year is going to be good because um, bass when they're in the grass, you're going to have to punch through that, that vegetation. I was talking to, what's your name? Dennis. Dennis. I was talking to Dennis before we got started. And, you know, you guys are going to Chickamauga. Uh, is it this week or next week? Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay, so you're going to Chickamauga in two weeks. In two weeks, they could be blasting a frog. I, I don't know. I mean, it's looking like the weather's going to cool down. Usually when it cools down, we get those first few good cold days of the year. That's when they start eating the frog good. But I got a buddy that lives down there right now, and I fish with him a lot on Chickamauga, and they're not eating the frog. And uh, he'll go down, you know, a grass line, and he'll throw a frog, throw a frog, and he'll get any bites. He'll go back down through there with a punch rig, and he gets all the bites doing that. And so when you guys go down there, something that you might want to look into getting is a big punching weight and a, or a full punch rig. I use Beast Coast uh, Tungsten. It's a company that I work with. But I promise you, you're not going to find any more affordable tungsten. Um, they do it all a cart, and what the, you know, everybody knows what all a cart means. You can go in, you can pretty much pick out whatever you want. So say you want four ounces, uh, two half ounces, some shaky heads, and whatever else. You can buy it all individually, as many as you need. Um, so I'm going to be using Beast Coast. This is a <coughs> ounce and a half punching rig. And then here is a ounce um, just punching weight. And all this is is just a flipping weight. And it's just a really heavy flipping weight. Um, here, I'll pass these around so you can see them. The punching rig is just this weight pretty much with a, uh, well, what am I? Go throw it. Yeah, go throw it. Everybody wash your eyes. Um, it's pretty much this weight with just a little uh, attachment down here that they tie a jig skirt to. And all those are hand tied with wire. So those are, those are really heavy. And what that's made to do is if you were to take like a half ounce or a three-eighth, you would literally have to like toss it up in the air and let it have the momentum to get through those mats because those mats can get two, three, four, even five inches thick. Um, so you're going to have to have super heavy weights to punch through that vegetation. And what those bass are doing, just like with the frog, they're just hanging out under there. It's caved out. It's like a big house for them. I mean, it's literally like the perfect house for a bass. And they kind of hang out down there and, you know, little bluegill swims by and he goes, hey, I'm going to eat that. Boom, and he eats it. You know what I mean? And that punch rig is designed when you pair it with something like a creature bait. Um, this is what I got on here. This isn't a, a punch rig, but this is just a half ounce. But you pair it with a creature bait or something like this, um, and it's just a great bluegill imitator, crawdad imitator, um, bait fish imitator, or even a frog. You know, frogs swim underwater, so when they dive down into the mats, you're going to try to imitate that. And a lot of the times when that thing punches through there, it's not really a finesse kind of bite. You're not, you know, sitting there jiggling in their face. It'll punch through, they'll react to it. And if they don't react to it on the initial fall, you can pump it up. And what I like to do is let it fall all the way, jiggle it a couple times, and then pull it up 
to right under the mat, and you'll see the mat bulge. Like there'll be, when the bait hits it, the mat will kind of pop up. Just pop it in there a couple times, no bites, pull out, flip to the next spot. It's just like flipping cover, like boat docks or lay downs or anything like that. Um, when it comes to that punching rig, this is my rod, and uh, this is the meat stick. This bad boy right here is, is made to do one thing, one thing only, and that's get them out of stuff like really thick lay downs, mats, and stuff like that. It's a seven and a half foot, uh, heavy, fast action, and it's really more of an extra heavy, extra fast action. Uh, G-Rod Game Changer, another company I work with, and uh, these will be sitting up here. You guys can look at them afterwards or whatever you want to do. <coughs> Again, I'm pairing that seven water higher gear ratio reel and 65 pound braid, and I'm always going to peg the weight. Um, so I'm going to use bobber stops like these right here, and I'm going to peg that weight down um, against my hook, and then for the hook, I'm actually using a straight shank flipping hook and I'm tying a snail knot. Anybody used a snail knot before? Yeah, yeah, sort of. I'll, uh, I think I've got a video on it on my channel, so you guys can go look at my channel. I've got, in any of this, I'm actually recording this right now, so any of this um, that you guys want to watch afterwards, I'm gonna have this on my channel. Um, I got cards up here. It's just Alex Road Fishing on YouTube. So you guys can go back and, and review all this stuff. But that's the hook I'm using. It's just a four aught, um, I think that is a jungle hook by owner, or y'all got to. It's one of them. It's big and it's mean. Yes. Now, since between here and Bonor on Tell Up the Lake, there's only three blades of grass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, we don't have to deal with punching through anything. What, what do you recommend for this kind of water? I would, for that, I'm going to just go with a normal flipping setup. And that's what kind of I was going to get into next. That's, you know, your lighter stuff. Um, I like to flip log jams is one of my favorite things to fish or really heavy lay downs, bushes, um, buck bushes, uh, willows, all those kinds of things, boat docks, anything that a bass can orient to. Um, so lakes like Teleco, Loudon, um, for the most part, you're not going to have a ton of grass. Mountain Hill's got a lot of grass, but I don't think the bass are smart enough to get in it yet. I don't understand that. Uh, but most of these lakes around here, you're not dealing with a lot of grass. So just look for cover. Cover-oriented fish this time of year are a big thing. Um, they start to move back up from the deep water. They start to get ready for the fall. They start eating a bunch of bait fish. So just find some cover um, and flip. Like I said, I'll, my literal go-to, I almost always flip a half ounce and I'll use the same, pretty much the same setup. If I'm in really, really clear water, I'll tie a 20 pound fluorocarbon leader. And um, I won't do it super long, maybe two foot. Um, because for the most part, it's going to be a reaction bite. When that bait falls through whatever you're flipping into, say it's around a boat dock or something, on the fall is usually when a bass is going to eat it. And you know, if any of you guys were flipping, you know that. You flip in there, tonk, hit them, and you bring them out. Um, but I'm using pretty much the same setup just with that fluorocarbon leader. Now, any questions? All right. Now, the next thing is top water. I love, I mean, like, who doesn't love fishing top water? It's, you know, it's just the best. It's just like the frog. Anything where a bass can come up and I can watch them eat something, that's what I'm all about. So, like I said in the video, I'm going to have a couple of different top waters. Uh, my main two is some kind of plopping, buzzing, you know, like a buzz bait, a whopper plopper. Really, with the invention of the whopper plopper, like the buzz bait is kind of going on the back burner for a lot of people, but don't discount it. It still catches fish. I mean, I've got buddies that will beat your eyes out with a buzz bait where the water plopper won't catch fish. And then my other thing is a walking bait. And these are just two that I have with me. I'll run another water plopper and then I've got another big walking bait I'll show you guys here in a minute. Um, but for the most part, this time of year, fall time, the bass are gonna be hyper aggressive because they can sense that the change is coming. They know it's about to get cool. They know they're gonna go some time without eating um, and that they're probably gonna to have to come up, eat, and then go back down deep. So they're gonna be hyper aggressive. They're gonna be going after bigger bait fish. They're gonna be going after those meals that are worth eating. Um, because a bass is just like any other animal. It doesn't wanna to have to expend any more energy than it needs to. So a lot of the times they're gonna go after big bluegill, big gizzard shad, I mean, even swimming right out here, people don't realize there's gizzard shad that are 12 inches long. And for a four pound largemouth, that's really nothing. I mean, you gotta think about how big their mouth is. They'll eat that stuff. I've caught three, two, three, four pound fish on eight inch swim baits. 
and they eat them like it's nothing. And it's just because they're mean. I mean, I always tell people, if a bass was any bigger and had any bigger teeth, we'd all have to worry because they'd try to eat us. I mean, they don't eat about anything. They're just mean, and that's the best part about them. And so I'm going to lean towards bigger stuff. 130 size Whopper Plopper, um, kind of just everybody knows the Whopper Plopper by now. It took the world by storm. And then this is a Super Spook. Um, when it comes to the Super Spook, I'll do the like the normal. This is the three hook, and then I'll do the normal two hook. Um, then I also there's a few like a Sammy Lucky Craft Sammy is one of my favorites. All the sizes of that thing are going to catch fish. Uh, this is something I actually just picked up that I'm going to test out. And this actually won the Forest Wood Cup. Um, so if you guys follow FLW, the boy who won that thing won it throwing this right here. And it's a, I'm a, a big stick or a little stick. And it is just a really big, loud topwater. And like I said, you know, I'm going to lean more towards these big, loud topwaters just because these fish are going to be aggressive and wanting to eat those bigger baits. And you're going to be, you know, that's the best time about this time of year and in the spring around here is that's when you can go out and kind of almost experiment. You can go, okay, I've got this big swim bait or this big top water or this different kind of spinner bait and go out and throw it because these fish are just eating anything and everything pretty much they can get their mouths on. But when it comes to bigger baits, that's what they're really going to go after and hit hard. Um, when it comes to all my top waters, I'm throwing it on a 6.9 medium game changer. Um, I got a 7 to 1 gear ratio reel, 30 pound braid. I use the medium rod because of the braid. Um, I uh, found myself throwing a little bit heavier. I threw a medium heavy for a while and I would rip the, rip the hooks out of fish, especially fishing the braid. I fish the braid because it just makes it a lot easier to walk the dog with you know, certain top waters, uh, like this one especially. You can throw a super long cast, barely work it, and you're going to be able to walk the dog because there's just no stretch in that braid. But I went with the medium just because it has all that parabolic bend in it. Um, so when I hit a fish hit easy, I can lean into them. That rod is going to compensate for that no stretch in that braid, and I'm going to bury those hooks in a fish instead of ripping them out. Um, because there's nothing worse than having a four pound smallie hit hit a big top water and then you rip the rip the hooks out of it, or it gets next to the boat, makes a run, and it rips the hooks out of it. Set, which I've had both of those happen to me before. So just kind of experimenting with that, I've come up with this system. And then sometimes, like again, if you're fishing super clear water, fish seem to be, um, like the other day I was on Cherokee, fishing a big spook, and uh, the fish were coming up. They, I mean, just bum rush it. You'd see them. And they'd make all kinds of commotion. You'd think, oh my God, you know, this is a, it's a huge one. They were big, they were big smallmouth. But they would, I think, would see the line or see the boat. I'm not really sure which one was going on. They come up to the top water and then they just turn down off of it. And so you put on something like a mono leader, a little bit clearer, a little bit more translucent. It may get some of those more finicky fish to bite, especially Teleco. It being such a clear lake, it's gonna, you know, you might have to go with some of those more uh, finessey, finicky kind of approaches. Now with my whopper plopper, uh, this thing. I tell you the truth, I used to hate it. <clears throat> I used to hate it. I used to not be able to catch fish on it. I'm not really sure why. And then all of a sudden, one day they started to bite it, and I fell in love with it really quick. Um, because I've never had a fish eat something like it eats a whopper whopper. Any of you guys have thrown it, you know they just <coughs> roast it. Um, I'm actually throwing my whopper plopper on a seven and a half foot medium heavy. Um, this is a Pro Bax by, by G Rod. And uh, I'm going to throw in on 17 pound copolymer. Uh, like P-Line is what I use. Uh, the reason I go with the copolymer is just because it's really, really tough line. Um, I like the little bit more stretch in it since I'm having to throw a little bit bigger rod. Um, the 130 size whopper popper, if I'm not mistaken, weighs like an ounce and a half. Um, so you're going to need a, a pretty good heavy rod to hook this thing around and not break something. And then just because I'm using heavy rod, I'm going to use the line with a little bit of stretch. Now one thing that I do uh, because I've ruined whole spools of line with this thing. If you hook anything or anything gets in this back plopper on this whopper plopper, you guys know it starts barrel rolling. And when your barrel rolls, it's going to twist your line. And I've ruined a whole spool of line before. You do it twice, get something hung up on it twice, barrel rolls back to the boat. The line starts wrapping around the end of the rod. It's all tangled up, just twisted. It slows you down, pisses you off. You know, you're sitting in the bottom of the boat. That's no fun. So what I started doing is run a snap swivel in front of all my whopper poppers. And what that allows it to do is if I hook a leaf, that bait can twist on that snap swivel 
and you're not going to ruin all your line. And then plus with that uh, snap, you're going to easily change in between colors if you want to or even baits. Um, say you're, you know, fishing a weight bait or something and you're switching in between them, unsnap it, throw it on there, you're good to go. And then it gives it a little bit more free range of motion. Um, the, the split ring that's on there does that. I mean, you're going to be able to catch them on it. It's not like you can't catch fish without the, the snap and the uh, swivel. But that, that snap always just gives it a little more free range of motion. And so if, you know, you got a big one come up tail walking, this bait is going to have that range of motion to go back and forth and you're not going to have them throw it. And that's just, that's my setup for my top, for all my top waters and then for my whopper flopper as well. And then um, on there I'm using a 6-3 gear ratio reel. The uh, reason I do that is just because I use this rod kind of, this is my general purpose rod, this is my everything rod. I throw jigs, Carolina rigs, whopper ploppers, weight baits, I mean everything on here. So 6-3 is just kind of my general purpose reel. Any questions about any of that? Uh, it's a Shimano Citica, is what that one is. And then the other one was a Luz, and then I've got a, the dowel was on my, my flipping, my flipping stick. And really, when it comes to reels, I'm looking for whatever I can find a deal on. I picked that Citica the other day. This is just a great piece of information for anybody that's a deal shopper like I am. Uh, I eBay shop a lot. And I found a guy, he was actually selling those Citicas. He, he would put them on there for $99. Uh, which they're 150 retail. Put them on there for $99 and he, he would repost them every time they didn't sell it. So he put them on there for a set amount of days. I actually ended up picking it real up for $69 brand new in the box. So, and it's, I mean, it's a Shimano. You can't beat it. Those are some of the best reels in the world. Now, the next thing is something else. You know, my problem is I like to say this is my favorite thing to do because, like, I pretty much will throw anything that the fish are biting. Um, so, Everything in this box is going to be my favorite. That's because I just know fish will bite it. Um, but my next thing is a spinner bait. This is just a great bait fish representation. I mean, if you want to represent a um, either an individual bait fish or a small pot of bait fish, this is going to be the one to do it with. I use Nichols um, pulsators. It's the only spinner bait I use. I've got about 150 spinner baits. Every one of them is a Nichols. Been using Nichols even before I've worked with them. Um, my dad got me on Nichols spinner baits and uh, ever since then that's all I've used. The reason reasoning behind it really is I'm not sure. I don't know what they do. This spinner bait's just special and I love it. Um, from the metal flake on the blades, the blade design, all that kind of stuff, it's just, just a good all around spinner bait. Uh, for the most part, 90% of the time I'm going to be throwing um, a half ounce. Sometimes I might go a little bit lighter might go a little bit heavier um, if I want to, you know, reel it a little bit slower or wear it a little bit faster. Just kind of let the fish tell you what they want. Um, you guys know some days it's like you got to reel it, two or three handle turns, pop it, let it sink a little bit, reel it a little bit, and you know that's like the weird cadence that they want. And so just experiment with all your cadences. Experiment with the spinner bait. Um, I'm going to throw this. I actually, didn't bring that rod with me tonight. Um, you can throw it on the seven and a half foot medium heavy. I mean, that's just a great all around rod. I throw this on a seven and a half or seven to three heavy rod, but it's a heavy moderate action rod. And the reason I do that is because, like with spinner baits or chatter baits, it allows the fish to kind of eat it. Um, a new trend right now in, in the you know Elite Series Pro guys, they're actually using glass rods for spinner baits and chatter baits. And that moderate action, it just allows that initial, when they initially eat it, allows them to eat it, and then you hit into them, that moderate action loads up good and it drives that spinnerbait home. Um, but I'll pass these spinnerbaits around. For the most part, I'm gonna stick with some kind of shad pattern. Um, that is a blue pepper flake. It's just a um, white with blue iridescence. And then this is a blue shad, which is kind of the same. It's a, it's a more solid white, milky color with blue iridescence. And as you guys can see, uh, you can look at the blades on these things and the heads. They have been just ate up. And on all my spinner baits, I'm running a trailer hook. Um, I never fish a spinner bait without a trailer hook. And the reason behind that is, is because I've caught probably more largemouth and smallmouth and spots on that trailer hook than I have on the actual hook of the spinner bait. Um, now, you know, shad spawn time, when they're crushing it, a lot of the times it doesn't matter. I mean, they'll eat that thing so deep you gotta dig it out of their throat. 
But other times, especially like clearer water, um, they'll come up and just try to kill it and they want to come back and eat it. But when they swap at it, at the back of it, they're going to grab that trailer hook and you're going to be able to get a fish that you might not have been able to get into the boat. You tip, tip that at all? Do you tip the trailer? Um, sometimes I do. Sometimes I'll uh, actually, uh, just a small, uh, so it just depends, but a smaller boot tail swim bait. Um, or paddle tail swim bait, you know, like a Berkeley uh, Havoc makes one, Mega Bass makes a couple, and I'll actually thread it up on the main hook and then put my trailer hook on there. That way, if what'll happen is it's just like fishing, if any of you guys fish an A rig, um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll actually put that, that trailer on there and I'll take like a chartreuse pin and put just one line on the tail. And it's one of those things that you wouldn't think that that would get a fish's attention that much, but when I'm fishing an A-Rig, this is where I really learned to do it. I actually was watching the Mark Zona. He's a commentator for the Elite Series. Funny dude, I love him. Um, but he kind of uh, taught me this trick, is that those bass are gonna focus in on that difference. So when, they're, when that spinnerbait's coming through the water, you got two blades and they'll hit that. And when they hit that, they're gonna either eat that thing all the way and get that main hook or eat that thing and get that trailer hook. You're gonna be able to get them into the boat. Um, with that, I'm fishing 6.3 gear ratio reel um, just because I tend to fish fast. I'm such a power fisher. You guys notice like this whole box is nothing but power fishing techniques. Um, I will slow down. I do throw shaky heads, Texas rigs, anything, you know, Carolina rigs. I'll throw all those things, but if I have my choice, I'm, I wanna be up there, you know, jerking something, reeling something, moving around, this is the way I fish. Um, so I use that 6-3 gear ratio reel, just kind of slow myself down, give that spinnerbait a chance. Um, one thing I always do with the spinnerbait is I never reel it on a straight retrieve. I'm always throwing a twitch or a pause or something in there. And I've found that when that spinnerbait's coming through the water column, um, if you watch it or watch any underwater footage of a spinnerbait, it kind of hangs almost. It kind of hangs in the water column and it just kind of comes through the water column. Well, when you twitch it, it comes forward real quite quick and it's just that split second of pause. It's just enough for a bass to just want to crush it. So a lot of times you'll have bass track things like spinnerbaits. Um, and if you go watch, I would really highly suggest go watch uh, Chris Zaldane. He's a pro. He did some underwater footage of an A-Rig. Um, Mark Zona's done underwater footage of an A-Rig. Um, and there's, I'm sure, Tactical Bassin is another YouTube channel. Um, they've actually become famous um, just from YouTube. They've done a bunch of underwater stuff. And you can kind of see how bass will track. They'll track things for feet, 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 I mean 10 feet. And there's just one little difference in the way it's retrieved or it hits a limb or it slows down a certain way. And that's when the bass takes advantage of it um, just because they're predators. It's like a cheetah stalking a, you know, a gazelle or whatever. They wait for it to get away. They wait for it to do something different to look like it's vulnerable. That's when they're going to attack. And that's what I do with the spinnerbait. So just make sure you know, you're, you're reeling it slow, giving it those twitches and all that kind of stuff. When it comes to the spinnerbait, and, I, and, and with the pop water, I kind of didn't cover this. Um, again, cover oriented, hard cover. Um, this time of year, I like to throw a spinnerbait on uh, flats with boulders on it because the fish will pour into those boulders. I like to go down, you know, uh, riprap banks. Uh, chunk rock banks, slate banks, it's things that bass are oriented to. Same thing with the top water. Um, like this time of year, even down on Loudon, uh, you go to a point um, that has rock on it. Those big smallmouth will just find a boulder, you know, not even as big as that thing. You know, it's small. Like it's just big enough that they can get tucked in behind and they'll just chill out right there and they'll wait for something to come by. When it comes by, they'll rush out and they'll eat it. And it's just total reaction, uh, opportunistic. It's the same thing with any piece of cover, whether it be lay downs, boat docks, all that kind of stuff. You want to go and try to find the deepest, darkest place because that's usually where the fish are going to be hanging out. Um, and now, you know, sometimes you get those days where they're just hanging out on flats or just hanging out and they're just eating anything you throw in there. You know, there's exceptions to everything. These are just really generalities, generalities that I'm going over um, when it comes to fishing and stuff. Uh, any questions? Good. All right. So the next thing is probably the one thing that I'm going to fish the most, and that is small body crankbaits. Um, starting pretty much into this month, all the way back around through almost May, um, you know, as the water cools down and gets cold and it starts to warm back up, 
I'm gonna have a small body crankbait tied on. And there's really a couple um, that, I, that I stay with. One is a square bill. Um, this time of year is when I'm really gonna fish that square bill. And it's just because, like I said, those bass are gonna start moving back up shallow. They're gonna start following those bait fish up shallow. Square bill is just a great way to get around cover, especially if bass are wanting something moving. Because some days you'll, you know, the bass, they won't want a spinner bait. They won't want something on top. Um, and, but they'll still be orienting to cover or uh, rocks or something like that. And the square bill is just something you can get in there and you can get out. Um, I'm going to throw this on a seven foot medium heavy glass cranking rod. Um, it's made by G Rod. I don't actually have it with me today, uh, but this one is my big one. This is my 711, made for fishing deep cranks. But pretty much the same, the same principle with the parabolics and the glass and the rod. It's a moderate action, and it's going to have a lot of load and a lot of bend in that rod. And what that allows you to do is just really bury those hooks into those fish. When it comes to treble hook baits like this, and when bass are eating a crankbait, that moderate action, that glass rod just loads up well, drives those hooks in, and you're going to be able to get those fish um, to the boat. So the square bow is definitely one I go to. Not something I fish a, a tremendous amount, but I still fish it nonetheless because it gets a bunch of bites. Now this right here is the, is the bait, or the couple of baits, or the style of bait, I guess is the best way to say, that I'm gonna, I'm gonna do most of my work with. And this is the small body, yes? Go back to that uh, square Yes, sir. Colors. Colors, all right. So with the square bills, I'm gonna stick mostly with a shaft pack. Um, just because it has a super tight wobble, it's made to imitate those shad. Um, for the most part, fish are going to be eating shad um, when you're eating, or when they're fishing, well, when their fish are eating the square bill. Um, you know, if you're fishing a little bit clear water, go with something more nat natural, you know, it's a citrus shad, but you know, some, some whites, some blues, a little bit of chartreuse. The dirtier the water gets, the more chartreuse you're going you're gonna to want to get out. Um, so like if you're fishing one of these days when they jerk loud and down um, and you're wanting to fish something that's going to get the fish's attention, square bill, chartreuse, the tight wobble, the loud rattle, in correlation with that flash of that color, they're going to eat. Um, now when it comes to like all my top orders and stuff like that, for the most part I'm going shaft patterns. Um, you know, and it's one of those things is just because we don't really live in a place where bass are big bluegill eaters. You get down to Chickamauga, you've got some crappie eaters. Uh, they eat land parades down there. Uh, but all these, these lakes up, you know, past Chickamauga, Watts Bar on up, you're pretty much dealing with fish that eat shad 90% of the time. And if they're not eating shad, they're on the bottom eating crawdads. And um, that's really where these come in. And when it comes to these small body crankbaits, I'm going to really fish two colors. Um, this time of year. Something bright red or orange like this or something a little more natural. This is a Missouri crawl but it's still got some pink, some orange on the bottom and that's, uh, that's just because as the water starts to cool down um, the, sh the crawdads start to molt, you know, they'll molt several times as we have full moons and stuff like that. They start to get orange on them, on their bellies, on the tips of their claws. Um, some crawdads will even turn completely like bright orange, you know, they're like UT crawdads. Look like they're going to game day. And uh, in, when it comes time for, you know, those fish to start really eating on those crawdads, they'll, uh, you want a reaction bite out of them. And so when you have something like this, you know, obviously a crawdad, is, a crawdad isn't going to swim as fast as you can reel a crankbait. But if they're eating crawdads, they're going to react to a color. Um, you know, there's been a lot of studies done. Scientists don't know if bass see color or not, but they see something apparently. Because you can fish this and not get any bites, but switch up to a bright orange and get bites. Um, and I think really when it comes to these small body crankbaits, they're reacting more to the color and not as much to the, to the movement or, a, you know, it's not exactly mimicking a crawdad. Because if you watch a crawdad, they just kind of scurry around. They don't shoot through the water column really fast. Um, but I'll pass some of these around. This one right here is Missouri Crawl, one of my favorite colors. Um, you can see it's all beat up. I've thrown and caught a bunch of fish on this one. Um, then I'll also, that's a Bandit 300. Then I'll also pass around a Wigglewort. Um, another one of my favorites. 
Is that it's it? Right. I'll fetch that root beer. Yeah, it's, yeah, I think yeah. it's root beer and then the pink. I don't know what the pink is. Do you use these around riprap a lot? Yeah, that's yeah, that's what I was about to get into. Riprap, slate, and uh, bluffs are my, are my go-tos with these crankbaits. Um, there's certain lakes, you know, it's so hard to, it's so hard because we live in such a diverse place. I mean, we can go to Norris Lake and it's 20 foot visibility and, you know, you're fishing fish that can see you way before you can see them. Or we go to Douglas or Cherokee or something like that and, you know, you've got these big bluffed out places, fish like to orient to that kind of stuff. But just in general, with the, with the small body crankbaits, I'm going to be fishing bluffs, slate, um, anything that has a hard edge, hard to find edge, um, especially like Mountain Hill is just a great example of this. There's a lot of river channel there and those bass in the winter will suspend on those river channels and they'll move up and down throughout the day and eat. And if you can hit it right and you've got some big smallmouth or big largemouth that are wanting to orient to that, that uh, bluff wall that are eating on crawdads, you can go down through there with that thing and it's going to just do a good sharp deep dive. It's going to run down the edge of that bluff and usually they're going to be sitting somewhere on that bluff wall or right on the drop. And that's just a great way to catch them. Yes? You tie directly to the split ring with um, the kind of or I actually use a eating? snap on those. You use a snap? Yeah, I use a snap on all my crankbaits. All the way from the, the big ones down to the small ones, I'm gonna run, um, just depending on the size of the crankbait, this is a number two size uh, snap. And again, it's one of those things, it doesn't add any action to it, the crankbait's got all the action within itself. Um, but it's gonna allow you to easily change it between colors, because there are some days that I'll go, you know, four or five different colors on the bandit, and they're all just variations of a red color, but I'll finally hit one that they want. Um, Cherokee fish and even Loudon fish are synonymous with this. Is like they'll want this, but they won't want that orange that's almost exactly the same. They want this more muted color, um, and it's it's a thousand one reasons. Who knows? But um, but here's a great example. I actually got a split ring or a snap on that one. But I'm running snaps on on all of my current mates. Um, just easy to switch out and all that kind of stuff. Now the next thing is uh, just a fish catcher. This thing from from way back, I mean, I don't know when Rapala made the, the shad wrap, but when they did, um, I'd like to meet the guy and shake his hand because he's a genius. Uh, this bait right here just straight up catches fish and it's just a, it's a small shad imitator. Um, when it comes to shad wraps, for the most part, I want to fish shad patterns um, just because you know, shad wrap, why not? I will fish some oranges in this, but I've found for the most part, um, literally these two colors right here are, are it, uh, like a lot pattern and then a blue pattern. You'll notice something um, with a lot of the baits uh, like that punching rig I passed around has a little bit of blue in it, some, these jerk baits, these shad wraps. Um, most of our shad around here, except for l lobs, have some sort of blue in them. Um, so just blue is just the color, you know, that, that fish relate to around here. Um, but, Little shad wrap. I actually fish these on a spinner rod. I'm going a seven foot medium spinner rod, um, just a standard like 2500 size reel. And I actually fish braid on all my spinner rods to leaders. Um, so I do 10 pound braid to a 10 pound P line leader copolymer. Um, I fish copolymer when I'm cranking the small bodies too. And that's just because it's super abrasion resistant. If any of you guys have ever fished with P line, you know it's you got to use the boat to break it even 10 pounds. It's just good, tough stuff. That's the reason I use it. I got a lot of confidence in it. Um, but that's what I'm doing with the small shad wraps. And those are just super light. Um, and you know, sometimes I'll actually throw the, the bandits and the wiggle boards on a spinner rod if it's super windy. Um, you know, because there's some days when the wind's blowing that they're eating the best. And so, you know, you just get out the spinner rod so it keeps down on the frustration of backlashes and all that kind of stuff. Now these aren't wrapped. Yeah, those are wrappers. Those are those are actually glass wraps. Yeah, good. So it's it's a glass wrap, shad wrap. Um, the glass wrap actually has rattles. The shad wrap is balsa and does not. I fish both of them, and it's just dependent again on what the fish fish are wanting. But that that profile mainly is what I'm going after, and I think that's a number. I want to say number five or six. I'm not sure. It's it's like the middle size. It's not the super small one, and it's not the big chunky one either. 
So, but definitely just a straight out fish catcher. My dad turned me onto that one and he still beats my eyeballs out with it all the time. Sometimes I'll refuse to pick it up and he'll uh, he'll just commence to whipping my butt with it. So. Do you think the rattles help a lot? Um, I think it just depends. I mean, some days they want the rattles, sometimes they don't. It's just dependent. Um, when it comes to rattling baits or silent baits, um, the fish are going to pick it up pretty much either way. I would tend to go with rattles if the water's a little bit darker or if the fish are even being a little more lethargic. Uh, sometimes when you have louder rattles, um, a little bit more violent you know, action or, or sound, they'll react to it more. Um, so, you know, just play with it. Yeah, that's really with all this stuff is there's no definite way to go out and do it. You know what I mean? This is what I've had experience with. This is what works for me. Um, but again, there's guys that do it out there completely different than I do it, and they do just as well. And I think it's just that we're dealing with a little green creature with a mind of its own, and some days, and some, I mean, literally, you can go 10 foot down the bank, and they want a different color than they did 10 foot up the bank. There's no telling why, but, you know, that's, that's the fun of fishing, right? Is trying to figure out everything. Uh, so any more any questions about that or anything? Alright. Uh, I don't really remember the order on I think rattle trap was next. So pretty much anything, a lipless crankbait, um, I call it a rattle trap just because you know rattle trap was the original, but a lipless crankbait. This thing right here, um, I heard a lot of you guys like to fish a lipless crankbait. Uh, the buddy I was talking about that lives on Chickamauga actually caught his personal best uh, 10 pound. 12 ounce on a lipless crankbait. This exact one, not this exact one, but this this color um, in the red eye shad, same size and all that. So this thing just straight up catches fish. It's just a fish catcher. And the best part about this bait is you can fish it around light grass, you can fish it around light cover, you can yo-yo it, you can reel it, you can drag it, you can pop it, you can just do a thousand and one things with it. Um, it's a very versatile bait. Um, there's been a lot of money won um, with a rattle trap, and you, you guys can see um, something, I'm not really sure, I don't remember what happened there, but something big got a hold of that thing. Um, I'm really gonna stick to three patterns. Early in the year, when the water's still up, the water's still clear, the fish are wanting the rattle trap and they're eating a bunch of bait fish, I'm gonna go with a bait fish color. Um, chrome and blue is just your classic. Straight chrome, um, a chrome and chartreuse, a chrome and green, um, you know, just all the, all the colors that are out there. Uh, just that flash with that rattle is, is going to get them. Um, then they also make a two-tap version. It's just like a, it's like a one knocker. It's just, it's, it's just another variation. I found that sometimes they want that, other times they don't. Uh, as it starts to cool down more, um, you'll notice kind of a pattern here. The colder the water gets, the later we get into fall, transitioning into winter. The bandits, the rattle trap, the jerk bait, and the jig, these next few baits are stuff I'm going to fish in winter too. Um, so you'll notice I start to get out the crawl patterns and I, I really believe that's because the, the fish, what happens is the, the bait fish, you've got two fish I believe. I think you got fish that live shallow and I think you got fish that live deep and I think you have fish that move in between. And so when the, the shallow fish, when the bait fish move back off, they only really have one prey item and that's crawfish or bluegill that live shallow. shallow. And the crawdad is a big protein rich meal that's a lot easier to eat than the bluegill, so they start eating crawdads. Um, then there's just a whole another segment of fishing when it comes to deep fishing. If you guys ever heard of the Damiki rig, all that where you go out and you find the big schools of fish super deep. It's a whole another topic for a whole number a whole nother day. But um, you guys will notice I start going away from the, the shad patterns and start going towards the crawl patterns. So there's that one. So that's the that's the shad one, just the chrome blue. Uh, the chartreuse is for when the water's muddy. Uh, again, you're just mimicking bait fish, um, bluegills, things like that. The chartreuse just helps to stand out in that darker muddy water. You guys know TVA loves to wreak havoc on us. They like to jerk the lakes up and down. Um, that's just like the other day I was on Watts Bar on a good frog bite, and they decided to pulled the water up about four feet, blew out all the grass, all my fishing was gone. So you guys know this time of year, they'll start to jerk these lakes down. It muddies them up. So these chartreuses, these brighter colors, are just going to do a good job of standing out in that darker water. All right, any questions about the rattle trap or the lipless? That one's pretty much straightforward. I mean, I think everybody at some point has owned and fished a, a lipless crankbait. So.
Uh, now the next thing is a jerk bait. And this is a bait that um, I have caught a bunch of fish on, and in particular a lot of smallmouth. Smallmouth just tend to love a jerk bait. Um, I'm not really sure why. I don't know if it's just the, the visuals of it. A smallmouth are really visual feeders. But you tend to go catch more more smallmouth on a jerk bait. Um, but I've caught a lot of largemouth on a jerk bait as well. And this is going to be a bait I get out really as we go from fall into winter. Like it, this is when you know fall has kind of ended. All the leaves are off the trees. Winter has started to set in. The water's really cooling down. The bait fish are starting to move deep. The ones that don't start to die. Um, it's just a natural part of everything that goes on. And the jerk bait is going to do a great job of mimicking a wounded or dying bait fish. And I'm going to fish either. Um, these are both mega basses. You don't. You know, I don't have really any particular preference. I like a mega bass. I like a strike king. I like duo. They're all good ones. I'm usually going to fish a 110 or a 120 size. Um, I will fish small ones, just all depending on the forage that I'm seeing, what the bait or what the bass are eating. And for the most part, I'm going to fish really natural colors because. I'm going to fish in clearer water. A jerk bait is a very visual bait. You're not going to really be able to draw them with a jerk bait in dirty water. So I'm going to fish natural colors in clear water. I like to fish um, just a normal diver. This one's going to dive like three, four feet. And then I go with a deeper diver, which is going to go six to seven feet. And this is a bait that, I mean, the cadences are absolutely endless. I found days that I literally can jerk it and just leave it sitting there for three or four seconds, five, ten seconds, and then jerk it again, and that's when the fish eat it. Other days, they want it moving fast. So it's really about, if, you, if you're thinking, you know, I'm seeing bait fish, you know, hanging out, they're kind of starting to be slow, I'm seeing some bait fish roll up, or if you've caught a bass and they're spitting up bait fish and you think that they'll, they'll eat the jerk bait, um, you know, get it out, start playing with cadences, and usually within three or four fish, you'll have a cadence that they're like. Um, and with the um, jerk bait and the rattle trap, I'm going to kind of fish them in the same place. I like to fish uh, jerk baits on flats. You know, you'll find a big flat or a big, big point, humped out point. It's got rocks and stuff on it. Places bass are just going to kind of be hanging out. I like to jerk a jerk bait over those kinds of things. Um, same thing with the rattle trap. I'll yo yo it or just kind of slow roll it, twitch it um, through those kinds of places. And uh, then another place you can go with the jerk bait is bluffs. It's a great way. You hit those suspended fish that I was talking about earlier. They like to suspend on those bluffs. So a suspending bait that's going to get in their face and hang out um, is just a great way to get some of those really lethargic fish um, to fight. So here's some of these jerk baits. So I'm passing around a uh, mega bass. That's a Vision 110. This is a Vision 110 Plus. This is actually the bait I caught my personal best smallmouth on, um, a 5.8. That was in Michigan, though. So, yeah, that was in Michigan when I was throwing my bait, and there's a strike king. Yeah, if you ever look at a Mega Bass Vision 110, you'll swallow your tongue. But way too expensive, in my opinion. But they catch fish. I was catching fish up in Michigan, and I've caught fish down here. Um, two to one over other, even three to one over other jerk baits. I don't know what Mega Bass did with that thing, but they did it right. Now the last thing is the jig. This is uh, probably the bait that has caught more fish than any other bait in the world. Probably. Not sure. I mean, ever since the introduction of the Alabama rig, I'm not really sure when you got guys catching cold limits on one Alabama rig. But we all know the jig's been around for a long time. It just catches fish. It's just a great crawdad imitator, a great bluegill imitator. Again, this is a bait kind of like the rattle trap. You can do a little bit of everything with it. Uh, if you guys have ever watched Gerald Swindale, uh, Elite Series Pro, he talks about fishing a jig and how he literally has a jig tied on every event all year long. He never takes it off. And that's a great mentality to have. Um, when it comes to fall fishing, I'm going to do a couple things. Like I said, I love flipping. Some days they want a flipping jig. I uh, actually have, these are both Beast Coast jigs by the same company that makes my tungsten that I was talking about. Um, I love to flip a jig. This is a half ounce Vanquish flipping jig. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to pair it up with some kind of uh, creature bait crawl style trailer. I myself like to get something with some appendages on it, something that's going to have some kick. 
a beaver style bait with you know just flat legs it's not going to do as well because um, it just kind of falls straight down. So all I like to have is a little something that slows it down, puts a little vibration into the water, and um, it's the same kind of uh, concept with my flipping setup. Something with some opinions, something with a lot of kick. Now for my dragon jig, and I've discussed with um, the guy who actually owns Beast Coast, I'm actually helping him design a uh, soft plastic craw bait, and I'm actually getting design a color within that uh, bait line, and he, is calling it a passive action, which is really what a crawdad does. You watch a crawdad, he ain't down there kicking around, slinging around, crawdy chopping and stuff, like some of these baits do. He just kind of hangs out. You know, he, he, he'll fiddle a little bit and just sit there, fiddle around a little bit and sit there. His claws barely move, he barely moves. So when it comes to jig fishing, um, especially as it gets colder, some of those deeper fish that are hanging out, um, you're gonna have something that you barely move, you're going to be really finessy with it. You're going to give those bass a good chance to look at it, really determine, hey, that's what I want to eat. And most of the time, when they eat a jig, they're going to eat it good, and you just got to drive it home and get them into the boat. Um, but I'll pass both of these jigs around. And uh, both of these, again, are Beast Coast jigs. Um, one is the Dragon jig, and one is the uh, Flipping jig. Both of them, uh, the Dragon jig is, I'm going to fish half ounce, three quarter, depending on how deep I want to fish it. Um, with the flipping jig, three eighths or a half ounce, just depending on the rate of fall that I want um, to just determine what the fish I want. Um, and on, um, yes. He likes the football head. I love football head. Yeah. Uh, football head, and we're coming out, Beast Coast is with a, it's gonna be like an all purpose. Um, so it's gonna be a hybrid between flipping and football, and that'll probably be my go-to go-to just cause it's in the play. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, just straight. Yeah, I'm going usually going to just fish on this rod again. Um, seven and a half foot medium heavy, six three gear ratio reel, and 15 pound P line. And the six three gear ratio reel is good, especially if you're fishing those jigs deep or slow rolling. A lot of times um, when the, the water's warmer, or, you know, even when it's cooling down, I won't even drag the jig. I'll kind of just just barely creep it across the bottom, just kind of keep it moving kind of let it eat the bottom. Then other days, like I said, you're gonna to have to be super finessy with it. You know, you move it a few inches, let it sit. Move it a few inches and let it sit. What, what season will you use that, that jig? The flipping jig or the dragon? But, I mean, the, last the dragon? Um, I, I mean, I keep a jig tied all year. I mean, I catch bass deep in the summer on it, um, but I also catch bass deep this time of year on it. Um, you know, and just really, fall is just a great time. Late fall, as they start to slow down, get a little more, you know, methodical and slow, as they start to go deeper again, the, the dragon jig is just a great deep water. So, uh, but yeah, that's kind of it. Um, I don't know. <laughs> that's a lot, yeah. <laughs> See why I do the three minute Thursdays and just tell everybody to comment in the comment section that it's like you know take all those individual things. Uh, that's all you can do. That's all you got. That's all I got to say. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. 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 So if you guys got any questions um, about anything, um, I'll, I'm, I'm willing to answer them. We can talk about gear some more. Or, uh, and then I've got some Lucky Tackle Boxes. I guess we're going to do a drawing. Uh, one of the companies I work with, Lucky Tackle Box, was nice enough to give me a couple boxes and a little bait, um, a little bait package here uh, to give away to hopefully to you guys and get drawn the, the lucky number. So, yes, sir. How do you work that draw? When it comes to the draw, I pretty much just keep a, a constant motion, just kind of keep it going. Uh, one thing that I look for is on top of the grass, the only way I can describe it is the sound. Uh, it's like a th 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 sound. Um, so just keep that thing moving, kind of get that sound going, and usually it'll draw them up. Uh, one thing to add on the frog fishing and the map fishing, I forgot to discuss this with you guys, is when, especially when you go to Chickamauga uh, two weeks from now, uh, when you pull up to a map, you know, you'll be in this, you know, this big mass of grass. Listen, just take a minute, stand there, don't touch anything, don't throw anything. And you'll hear, it sounds like Rice Krispie Treats. And that's just, means the mat's alive. It means there's bugs in there, there's blue eating the bugs, there's crawdads eating, there's things moving around. Those are gonna be your most productive mats. Um, those are the ones you're gonna wanna throw the frog and punch, 
punch on it, how are we going to get the most bots out of this? So, any more questions? Thank you, Alex. Absolutely. Appreciate it.